<laughs> Hi everyone, uh, sorry for the delay. Uh, it's my great pleasure to uh, introduce Jan Stoika. Jan is a professor uh, at UC Berkeley um, in the East department. He's the director of the RISE Lab, uh, currently doing research on cloud computing and AI systems. Um, you, uh, past work uh, on Apache, uh, uh, Spark, Apache, Mesos, um, and without further ado, Jan. Uh, you hear me well? Yes. Yeah. Perfect. Um, it's a pleasure to be here and uh, thanks for coming, especially with such a nice weather outside. Um, so, um, like Roy mentioned, um, I am a faculty at UC Berkeley and um, I'm also director of Arise Lab. And in this talk, I'm going to give uh, some uh, overview about some of the work we are doing at. Uh, uh, Rice Lab, and I've been involved with. Uh, let me start with a few words about Rice Lab. So, what is Rice Lab? Um, it's a lab at Berkeley, obviously, which uh, um, it studies the design of real time intelligent, secure, and explainable algorithms and systems. This is Rice. Okay, so what uh, each of those attribute means, uh, let me say a few words, real-time means that we want to be a system which are able to respond very fast in seconds, even uh, milliseconds. Uh, intelligent obviously means we want to say that the decisions are intelligent, are good. Uh, secure, uh, we want this decision to, uh, when we take this decision, we want to protect the data and system integrity as well as the data confidentiality. And explainable, Especially if the decisions are taken by neural networks, obviously people want to be explainable, to understand why a particular decision has been made, especially when the decision is surprising. Uh, this is a holistic effort and includes faculties across AI, security, hardware and systems. And we are supported both by NSF through an expedition grant and a bunch of uh, companies who are sponsoring our lab. Um, so, um, in this talk, I am going to focus in particular only on two aspects. Um, it's systems and machine learning with a little bit touch on security, and I'm also going to touch a little bit on security. Okay? And um, at Rice Lab, we build systems for machine learning and use machine learning for systems. So, um, and I'm going to give a few examples here. I'm going to give two examples in each case. For systems, I'm going to talk about two projects, Ray and Helen, and which illustrate, and, and then for using machine learning to improve the systems, I'm going also to talk about two projects, NeuroCats and AutoPandas. Okay? So, let me start with uh, the system side, with Ray. And this is a project we've been working on for the past three years. It's one of the largest projects now in the Rice Lab, and it's quite popular out there as well. And when we started this system, and, and uh, it's, it's, it's built on, 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 on two premises. And um, so one, and it's, you see this trends more and more, applications are becoming distributed. Uh, and the applications are also becoming more and more complex. So let me argue for the first point, which is an easy one. Uh, you've seen this, probably everyone has seen this the plot, this is our overlay on a, on a plot from OpenAI, which is very well known by, by very well known uh, by now. This was last year, something. And what they show on the y-axis, they show uh, the compute requirements to train a state-of-the-art model, machine learning model, at that particular given time. On the x-axis, you have the time. On the y-axis, in the log scale, you have they use petaflops per day, how much, how many days worth of a petaflops computing you need to train a particular model. And basically what they say is that, well, you know, if you look at this graph, the compute requirements doubles every 3.4 to 3.5 months. Okay? Now, to put that in, into perspective, the Moore's law in its heydays used to double the compute capabilities of the chips uh, in every 
18 months. Okay? Now, if you do try to, you know, to use that matrix, how many times the requirements in this case are going to increase over 18 months is between 35x and 40x. Okay? And now, obviously, you are going to say, well, what about the specialized hardware? The point about specialized hardware is going to just move on the y-intersect because they are going to be, again, you are know much more about the workload and you are going to build a chip optimized for that workload. But once you are there, and they are still not going to grow faster in capabilities than the Moore's law, right? And obviously, the other biggest problem is actually also then our scaling, the sister law of the Moore's law, which basically says that it used to be that Every 18 months, uh, on the same and in the same area, you can uh, have double the number of transistors, and the power consumption remains the same, right? So that's what. That's no longer the true truth. And what that law is in particular important is when it comes. It's you here have compute, but the other dimension is memory, right? So the memory, it's, a, it's, it's again, it's very hard to grow. Actually, with compute. You still can play tricks because you have, you know, you, you have a particular workload, you know about workload, you can be smart about it, smart about building chips. But what you are going to do about memory, right? You still need a certain number of transistors for one bit to store one bit of, of memory. And that's also, if you look about, I don't have the plot here, it doesn't increase that we expect much more. And um, what can I say? It's like, um, if you look at the best GPUs today, the top of the line, they have 32 gigabytes. Right now, as a rule of thumb, the way to think about if you have a model with one billion parameters, you may get out of memory for if you run it on a, if you train it on a GPU with 32 gigabytes. A few days back, Microsoft came with a model for NLP 17 billion parameters, and they are talking about 100 billion. Okay. So anyway, so the story here is that, you know, if you look at these plots, you know, really, if you really want to support this workload, there is no other way to do it than going distributed. The other point is that the application are becoming the more complex. You are talking about AI, but AI <coughs> will become really successful, will be embedded in the existing application, part of the existing applications, right? It's not just training and so forth. And, and let me give you an example here, which is a very simple example to illustrate this point uh, and illustrate the, you know, the limitation of the current state of the art in terms of systems to build this application. So this is a real use case, and uh, it's a very simple, you know, at high level, it's a very simple application. It's like from a fintech company, it's the largest in the, in the world, although I cannot use the name. But basically, when you log in on your start their application on the phone, they want to recommend to you um, uh, some of their new services or products of their, their affiliates. So it's a recommendation system, right? Um, the, and how, if you look at how this looks like, you know, as a high level, it's quite simple. You get the logs from the users, you featureize them, you find the features, then you train, and then you serve. Right? You get the logs, you see what the user have done, you, learn, you develop a model based on that, and you sell the model so that the new users is going to benefit from what you learn from the action of the previous users. Right? This is everything is doing that. Okay? The, the key here, though, is that, it, and also it, with this kind of uh, uh, application, actually, there are two questions, important questions. Are one is that how fast can you update that model, and the other one, obviously, does it matter? And in their particular case, it, you know, intuitively it matters because they always come with new products and things like that, so they want to learn as fast as possible what is the user preferences so they can maximize the revenue from that new product. Okay? They don't want to wait for one week for the worth of mouse so people learn from others this is a cool product, right? Uh, right? Because in one, in one week or one month, other people will come with, will can come with competing products. Okay. Um, so, so they tried, you know, the, when, when they started, they started with training model every one day. And actually, one day is still pretty good if you look into industry, um, in, in, in the industry. So they tried and then they used, you know, they um, used the best of, 
uh, you know, state-of-the-art tools and systems, they put them together, they build this pipeline, and they went down from one day to one hour, okay? And uh, did it help? Yes, it did help. Uh, one of the main metrics here is click-through rate, right? It's basically the ratio of times you are going to click on what they are showing you on a product uh, uh, over the total number of times they show you that product, right? And 5% is a huge increase. And when you see this, what your next, what do you think immediately, right? Can I go lower, right? And it's, can I do it faster, right? So you want to get lower, but how? And here is a problem. Let me talk a little bit about the state of the art solution. So what do you, what do you do it? Well, you have visualizations. So you need to process some data. Then you need to train. You have a big model. They have hundreds of millions of customers, you guys. And you need to serve the model, right? Now, the point is that so each of them, each of these, in these stages, you need some kind of parallel distributed systems. But today, in order to each of these, uh, to support each of these workloads, you are typically using a different system. Like you want uh, data ingestion and visualization, you may use Apache Spark, uh, Flink with a combination of Kafka or something else. You want training, it's neural networks, you are going to use maybe, you know, Horobot or TensorFlow distributed and things like that, uh, distributed TensorFlow. You want serving, there are a bunch of frameworks here as well. Okay? So, therefore, what you have to do, you take the best framework for each workload and you have to integrate them. Right? This is what you do. Compose it. The problem is, there are a, a, a few problems here. Many. If you want to build an application this way, first of all, you need to develop that application. And because you need to deal with different systems, they have different APIs, probably different languages, that's how. Now, say you build it. Now you need to deploy it and operate in production 24 by 7, right? Now you have to do that with different systems. And by the way, just think about, and, and uh, like if you think about the, uh, the failure semantics and so forth, it's a nightmare. Each of them, they have different failure semantics which are not well documented, you don't have, they are not described in any formal way and things like that. And then it's slow because you need to move the data from one system to another. Right? Each of them they, it has its own peculiarities and things like that. So that's the reason it's hard to, to go uh, to the flow. So are these, when you're referring to models, are, you, are these individualized, precise models? Are you learning the model, in this case, for the whole population? Um, you, in, oh, it doesn't matter. Yeah, it, it doesn't matter. You, you, you do some incremental, you, you don't do it from scratch every time. Right? But, you, or, but you do try to, to learn from, you know, you have the data from the entire population. Right? And that's why it's a lot of challenge. Yeah. You know, they don't reveal to us exactly what, how they use it. It's, it's uh, okay. And you have even more complex patterns because, for instance, if you talk about training, you don't talk about training, you talk about hyperparameter hyper tuning. Right? Actually, at Rice Lab, we have a lot of huge number of credits. Uh, uh, from Amazon, and for a while, you know, before starting, you know, if you're comfortable fitting, uh, you know, everyone using these credits, you still have to spare. When we started to do this machine learning, we ran out rapidly out of credits. And the reason was, one of the reasons is this hyper parameter tuning. People write papers, and they have to figure out what the parameters they have to use to get the proper graphs in the paper. Uh, okay. And you not talk about serving, but here you have A-B testing and things like that. And, and then you are talking about reinforcement learning. So in addition to all of this training, serving, uh, data processing, you also have simulations, right? So, um, sorry. Oops. Okay. So fundamentally, this is what you have. So today, if you look at the machine learning ecosystem, you have a bunch of workloads, and for each, like, this. And, and each of these are workloads because the volumes of data and the demands in the computation, you need to run it in a distributed manner. And people developed for different of these workloads, they developed good distributed systems to handle this work, distributed frameworks to handle these workloads. The problem is that, again, in an end-to-end -end application, you need to put them together, and that was the challenge is, right? That's the complexity. Um, so, um, so what is Ray, 
So Ray fundamentally, it's a general purpose distributed computing framework um, which supports all these workloads, right? Uh, and how you support all these lot of workloads is you support via libraries, right? So you have a libraries for different workloads, okay? So next, let me tell you a little bit about Ray. I, 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 I have one hour, right? Like, okay, so I have to get faster. Um, I, I'm going to give you the intuition. It's we have, you know, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the back end. Uh, the front end for now it supports Python. Why Python? You know, it's like because it's a lingua franca now, it's dominant API, both for data processing and for, ma for machine learning. Uh, it also has bindings for Java, if you wish. Uh, but, you know, so uh, as, a, as a high level, the reason um, Ray is general is because it takes these two constructs you have in most imperative languages, right, which are functions and object or actors, and basically, um, what it's doing, it's transparently runs them remotely concurrently, right? That's what it's, right? So basically how you do that, on the left hand side, you have a simple Python code, which is you have two functions, one to read some uh, array from a file, and then another one to add it, to add these two arrays, there's a Python code, and in, in order to distribute it, uh, to make it parallel, you add Ray Remote. This tells you that these functions, just look on the left hand side for now, when they are going to be invoked, instead of being run locally, they can be run distributedly or they can be run remotely. And um, then if you want to call them, um, when you call them, you also put remote to make it explicit in the program that this function can be going to be can be, may be executed remotely. And um, then the key which I'm going to show uh, next is that we also, in order to provide concurrency, we have this future abstraction. So a remote function is not going to return the value, the result is going to return a future, which is a pointer to the result. Um, and returns immediately, asynchronous. Right, and when you need the results, you do rate or get. And this is pretty much the entire API. It's very simple, very basic API. And if you, for, uh, for the, on the right hand side, you see a class, a simple counter class. If you use the decorators for the class, what is going to happen is going to in instantiate like an actor. It's like a microservice, which runs this code of this class and waits for someone else to invoke some method on that class, right? So that is why in general, because it takes these two constructs and remotely it can execute them transparently, remotely and asynchronously, right? So let me just give you this example why, what, what happens on the left hand side. So look at this code, you say you have two nodes, each, each node will, will uh, store one of the input files and let's start executing the program. The first one is to say read array uh, remote file one. So what, when you execute this infra in instruction, what happens is that you are going to schedule the function uh, which reads that file, uh, hopefully on the node of which, is, which has this file, right? Now, when you run this function, when you run this line, this, it's again, it's asynchronous. So it returns immediately. It returns this identifier to the result, right? And now you can go to execute the next, the next line, right? And the next line is going to run another the function, the remote function, to read file two on the node two. And then you go to the next line. So it's again, these are returned immediately. By this, and now you execute add line, yes. So do you do some static analysis to figure out any kind of dependencies? Python is extremely hard. Yes, we are trying to do it for different reasons, but uh, it's, it's so dynamic, it's extremely hard. Um, yeah, but that's a good point. Uh, but the, you know, the, the main thing to take away here is again, is that because it's asynchronous, provides these features, you are going to start running all these 
uh, you know, scheduling all these tasks. And um, still at this point, one, once you're, you know, one, once you're at this one, so let me go to the next uh, instruction. So up to uh, you get, you want to get the result, so do something with the result, up to this point, maybe nothing has been executed. Okay. Um, but because you can run this asynchronously, now you can extract the parallelism from this execution graph. Right? That's what it is. Make sense? Okay. Um, okay, so, so this is basically what, what, what it is. And um, so this particular company, um, which wanted to... So, so what will happen when you read or get executes? Will you block completely or will you block for... Excuse me. Well, what so happens? You? Some, when you say sum equals read or get ID. Yes. What happens at this stage? At this stage, this is going to block. For how long? Until, until the results are available. Because you need the results here. You need to take two. For the whole array? It will block for the complete array? Or will no, you contract, you, you, you block only until the operators, which produces ID in this case, gets the data, computes the results, and provides you the result. So it's only, you, you know, if, if I'm going to start running some, to read some other stuff, so but I'm not the using here. Things. Let's say each array had 100 elements in it. Hmm? Yes. Each of the array had 100, 100 elements, right? In it. Uh, when you do the add, what happens? Do you wait for the all 100 to Yes, I uh, wait for the same. It's not streaming. Oh. Um, we are looking into, into that, but right now it's not streaming. Yes. You need to get the entire results. Yeah, good. Good point. Okay. So going back to our example, so um, instead of this <coughs> stitching together this best of, uh, of breed systems, um, they use Ray, that's why I'm telling you this story, right, obviously. <laughs> and uh, um, with Ray, now they can implement all these workloads in the same system, right? Um, for, uh, you know, um, like for serving, for instance, you have now actors. You have microservices, so to speak. So it's easy to implement them, right? Uh, obviously, for data processing, you know, I show you a little bit uh, how you can do it. For training, um, we integrate with TensorFlow and PyTorch, and we orchestrate the entire training procedure. So how well they did? They went from one hour to five minutes, okay? And um, from these five minutes, Three minutes, it's about training, and two minutes is model deployment, because they also need to do some testing. This is quite amazing, actually, because, you know, aside from Ray or whatever, because, you know, to put the model in production is basically no human in the loop. You know, it's, it's not easy. Okay. Um, but, you know, it's a very aggressive company, so um, I think for me this is the most surprising thing and the most impressive one. So let me tell you a little bit about Ray architecture. Okay, so Ray architecture, and I'm going to try to emphasize what, what are the differences from the existing, uh, other existing systems. So at the high level, you know, it's, it's, uh, you have like in many systems like uh, Spark or Hadoop or things like that, you have a driver or you execute the program and you have a bunch of workers. Now, some of these workers, are special, like actors. A worker is something which sits there and executes functions. But if you have an actor, an actor is implementing as an, as, a, as, as an worker. In addition, what we have, we also have a distributed object store, right? So all of these arguments and the results for these remote functions and remote object for actors are going to be um, to be sent out through the object store, this object store. Right? It's like your distributed shared memory. The objects are immutable, so we don't have as much, pro we don't have problems with the consistency. And, you know, uh, okay, so and we use Apache Arrow, if you are familiar with, it's for serialization, <coughs> deserialization. And we have also a distributed scheduler. Right? You have a distributed scheduler, so basically each scheduler, when it gets a request, 
for running a function is tries to figure out whether it's going to be local or some remote uh, to send to another scheduler. Okay. So yeah. The, the other things what happens here is that unlike for instance Spark, where only the driver can um, uh, start tasks, the worker, workers only execute them. In this case, you can have nested uh, parallelism, nested execution. Uh, a, uh, a remote function can call another remote function and so forth, or create another remote actor. So you can do anything. And uh, asynchronous? And the execution will be asynchronous at that stage? Mm -hmm. the, it's asynchronous, right? When you call Yeah, it, the question is whether, yeah, it's a, it's a, the execution is asynchronous. Yeah, all the execution are asynchronous. The only blocking one is get. And we also have another API, which I haven't shown, which is called wait, which basically that is when you wait for many results and you want to start processing the results as they become available, you can do that. You wait only for a bunch of them to arrive, start processing, and then you wait, get the next ones. But yeah, except those, everything is uh, asynchronous. OK, and like I mentioned, a scheduler can ask another scheduler to execute a function on his behalf. So one particular aspect which is quite unique about the system is that um, in order to simplify it, you know, distributed systems are hard. And what is hard is about managing the distributed state, maintaining it consistent, and so forth. So what we do, we take the simple, pos what is a simple possible solution? You take all the state from the system, the control state, and you put it in a shared database, right? That's what it is. What is the state? An object table. Object table meaning or object directory, where each object is located. Uh, task tables, what task have been executed and what. You can actually get all this DAG I've shown you, the execution DAG, it's in here, it is task, uh, in, it's in, it's in this uh, uh, shared database. We call it global control store, okay? So, um, okay, so this is, you know, the task graph I showed. So this is pretty cool if you can do it and if it's working because it tremendously simplifies the system because again all the state you care about is in one place and is visible actually to everyone. Um, and the other cool thing is that once you have the state here, it's much easier to have debugging tools and so forth because you are going to look only at this state. You don't need to get collect state from all the nodes and see what happens. Uh, profiling tools and so forth. Okay, so that's what it is. Um, so the system I showed you, this one, one, one thing about it, you're very careful when you design it, is to be fully, to be very highly scalable. And now I'm trying to convince you that, you know, argue at a high level that it is. The scheduler is distributed. One. Uh, the, the, I, I told you this is like a centralized database, but it's only logically centralized. It's obviously we shared it, and it's not real database, it's Redis. Um, and the nice thing about, because all these tables, the identifier of the table, like object ID, task ID, and so forth, are pseudo-random. So it's very easy to share it. That is not, and maintain, you know, some, a lot balance it. Now, this is another very important, I, I mentioned to you that any worker can submit tasks, and this is very important. <coughs> Because even if you have a distributed scheduler and everything scales, actually the bottleneck turns out to be in the previous system as a driver. If the driver is the only one who can, who can spawn, who can uh, uh, run this remote task, it will become the bottleneck, right? Because typically you cannot spawn, you know, for maybe a few tens of thousand tasks because you need serialization and so forth. It's, it's a lot of overhead. Um, yeah, but now, if I want to, to run one million tasks, I'm going to ask, you know, and I can, each worker can only submit 10,000 tasks per second, I'm going to ask 100 tasks, 100 workers on my behalf to submit another, each of them, you know, 10,000 tasks. Right. Fault tolerance? Fault tolerance is lineage based. Um, it's, here it's a very long story, um, and I'm not going to have time to go over it. Um, and we started with the simple things, and 
if you have the task graph, if the data is object scheduler, it's immutable. Uh, at least for the function, if the function is either potent, um, there are no side effects, and many of those don't have side effects, uh, then you can get away by uh, using the lineage. You, you know, you, you, you lost, there is a failure, you lost the data, you lost the data uh, produced by some task. Uh, what you do, you re execute all the computations which created the data in the first place. This is how you recover the data. And this is used at some level in Spark and before that Hadoop. The tricky thing is about the actors, because the actors have internal state, and here we went through multiple iteration. Um, um, okay? Um, and we had even transparent for recovery, we transparently checkpoint the state, and then we remember what the order of the method on that actor, have, you know, the order in which the method has been executed and replay it. It turns out that in practice, in theory works, in practice not that well, there's too much overhead and so forth, but anyway, I'll, I'll be happy to talk about it. Um, the one thing I want to touch here, and this is again very briefly, is that um, is this, uh, this one thing, it's again about the efficiency. In order for this to work, and in order to be able to reconstruct the state, I need, when I execute every task, first I need to record that I'm executing that task in this global control store, right? Uh, and assuming that the task, again, its, uh, it's uh, execution are either potent, I have the, uh, um, um, at least one execution semantics, so in the worst case, I write here that the task is executed, but I fail before executing the task, there is no problem. I look here and I execute the task. Uh, if for some reason I execute, I, 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 I wrote here executing the task, I execute the task and execute the second time, again there is no problem, right? This is, but the main point here is that in general it's important for this kind of techniques to work to make sure that you write down that you executed the task, you lock it before you ask the task is executed. But this now means that writing this is on the critical path. Right, so you can slow it down. Okay. Um, so, we, 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 we had, in order to get rid of this uh, delay, we have this toy technique which is called lineage stash. And, and here is the idea, it is the idea, and I'm not going to go unfortunately in more details, um, but how do you get rid of this, uh, this overhead? Just the need to write, to log in the task execution before you execute the task. The answer idea is basically saying, when I'm sending the task to execute to a different node, I am going to embed this lineage in the call itself, right? So think about it, like when I'm, when I'm executing, when I'm a task and I'm executing, when I get the call to execute, the request to execute, I get all the lineage, I get everything, all the graphs, which construct my arguments, right? So if my arguments are missing, I have all the information about what I need to execute to recreate that, my arguments, right? That's what it is. So now, you don't need to go here, but of course, this lineage can grow indefinitely, right? So linear stash is a combination between the two. You do this embed the lineage in the calls, and then you aggressively checkpoint it to reduce this lineage. Anyway, so um, let me give you some plots, uh, scalability and performance. And uh, you know, here you have the number of nodes on the x-axis, uh, number of tasks, and because, again, you can is scalable, um, you, it's, you know, it's almost linearly scalable in terms of the number of tasks you can execute. Uh, is here you have, I don't know, 1.8 million, so it's close to that. Okay, and you can scale. And this again, because there is no particular bottleneck in the system. Uh, yeah, 1.8 million. Uh, latency of, of local task execution is 300 microseconds. Latency of remote task execution is around one millisecond. This is pretty, Good for many many applications. You know, it, um, so used what are the tasks here? Though? What, what are the tasks? What are you, what benchmark are you running against? So these are tasks you don't do much, don't do anything, right? 
This is just to give you the overhead to execute the task remotely, right? I see. Then you add, depending on what the task is. So because in your case, the overheads will be proportional to the state that you're transferring, right? For example. Yes, yes. But so these do not transfer. These are now off task. I see. This task don't do anything. I just need the overhead. Okay, and uh, here is robustness to null failures. It's um, it basically says on the throughput, the number of tasks I'm executing in the system on the y-axis, the left y-axis. On the right y-axis, I have the number of nodes in the system, and on the x-axis, the time since start. Right, is the time. So basically, what the this uh, dashed line shows the number of nodes in the system. So I'm starting at 50, then reduce to 49, then reduce to, I think, 25, then all the way 10 and go up, back to 50. So the and basically this is, hmm? is not for the scalability of the task, but for failures. For failures. This for is failures. for failures. That was, um, and the reddish thing is that says which the throughputs, how many tasks are executed. And this system, what you want to see is that this follows closely how many nodes you have in the system. The only thing to notice here, which is a little bit you know, interesting, is this blue, blue area. And that blue area, it's basically, uh, let me see, um, it's exactly, um, you see, it's of the reconstruction, remember. So if I remove this half of the nodes from the system, then quite a few of objects will go away. And if some other task requires that object, I need to reconstruct that object. So the blue is the overhead of the, of the reconstruction. Make sense? OK, and this is uh, basically this figure says that while Ray is pretty general, it performs reasonably well compared with a specialized system for different workloads. Serving training and simulations. Here, higher in all, the, in all examples, higher is better. Okay? I am running out of time, so I'm going to go faster. Okay? And look, you know, whenever, like, you know, whenever you build a system, there are a lot of interesting problems you find which you didn't realize in the first, uh, uh, the first time around. And um, there are a lot about scheduling policies, different applications, well, different <coughs> scheduling policies. Um, uh, and also, you have a distributed story system. A big question is also about management, right? Of the uh, memory management. Um, so Ray, uh, it's again, it's like has a bunch of libraries uh, on top of it. Uh, the most important libraries are RLLib, a reinforcement learning library. Um, high parameter search, we have a library, Qon, uh, some data processing library, Modin, and of course many other distributed applications. Um, it's quite popular. Um, it's uh, over 250 contributors. The vast majority is outside Berkeley. Um, more than 45 companies, and uh, you know, it's the adoption is growing quite nicely. Okay. Okay. So I have uh, uh, I have another 15 minutes for uh, five other, words, three other. Words. I'll be quick. Um, so the next one, it's uh, Helen. <coughs> so I'm switching gears now. So I'm Adam Israel. Um, and uh, so this is, the, 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 this, is about, this is about how you are going to learn on confidential data. Right? I'll go very fast. Okay. So for instance, you have, here is an example. You have a bank which wants to detect money laundry. Now, the money, la money laundry means that in the transaction graph, you have transaction graph, means there is a cycle. This money boundary means, right? There is, has to be a cycle because the money ha has to come back to me, right? So, and this includes different entities, different banks, right? So that's a problem, right? That's why I, I try to hide my trace, right? So the way to solve it is to have multiple banks putting together their data so that I can see the, 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 the transaction loops. Obviously, and then, but how do I do it, right? One obvious and the easiest way is to have some entity, maybe trusted entity, 
to get the data from all the banks and look at the cycles in the graph and detect money laundry, right? Of course, this is hard. Banks do not want to share. And they may not even, even if they want to share, they may not even be allowed to share because different regulatory constraints. Okay? Uh, so, the, but, so the problem is this one. This, this example illustrates clearly the problem we have to deal with. So you have multiple entities which want to cooperate for some mutual benefit, right? But they want, because maybe they are also in competition, or because of regulation, they cannot share the data in plain text, right? So how do you do that? That's a question, right? And this is what we call competition, competitive learning. Right, so competition, this is what it means. It's uh, collaboration between business competitors in the hope of mutually beneficial results. Uh, okay, so uh, I just gave you this example about the bank example. Another application in the banking, uh, in the financial industry, is uh, uh, it's uh, fraud detection. The more data and the more diverse data, the better, the more accurate models you are going to train, uh, so you can lower the fraud detection uh, uh, losses, the fraud losses. Um, here is a very another interesting example. Yeah, it's, I, I really like this example. This is uh, basically like you say you have multiple uh, multiple hospitals, like in California, they want to cooperate um, to detect virus outbreaks. It's a topical subject, right? But if, if something happens, say, in some remote area, even in California, Mendocino, and so forth, is that you really want to detect as fast as possible this happens because you, want, you are going to send, uh, you know, uh, vans with vaccines and so forth to try to contain the spread, right? <coughs> the problem is that this, this hospital cannot share the data even when they are in the same network. So this hospital is a Kaiser Permanent Hospitals. They cannot share the data because the patient privacy loss, right? So it's again, you have a case in which you have a lot of benefits in sharing this data to develop the model, you cannot. So this is Helen, it's cooperative learning platform for linear model via cryptography, with my colleague Raluca, which actually he, she is leading the project. And um, uh, what we use, we use multi-party computation. Um, and, um, uh, to solve this problem. And we also uh, use ADMM, which is another method. Uh, and by the way, this applies for now, is for linear models, so it's not general. It doesn't apply to any neural network. Uh, and because of that, we can use ADMM. So what ADMM gives you is that it reduces the number of rounds you need to do in order to compute, you know, to train the network, right? And it makes some trade-off between communication and uh, computation, but uh, in, the good, in the good direction for something like using MPC, the MPC now is like basically the ability to uh, compute the result of an operation, where the data, when the data is distributed to multiple parties without seeing the data. However, it's extremely expensive. It's very expensive. And here what you do, again, because you can do with ADMM, you can do more local computation and fewer communication, so therefore it reduces the overhead quite substantially. It has strong security properties, Helen. Attack, so the attacker can violate the protocol, uh, all, uh, even, and uh, it guarantees that even of all the other parties, are compromised, they are not my, the confidentiality of my data is guaranteed. Okay? And uh, it's working quite well. Uh, again, it's like, <laughs> this is uh, it's a data set from here, the CI, uh, with a, some prediction data set, you know, 90 feature. So it's not a big data set, uh, but um, and the number of samples is again. Uh, 100,000, 90 features, and, but it's, it's, it's again, instead of taking months, 
it takes a few hours. What is the estimate? Estimated baseline? Uh, excuse me? Estimated baseline? Uh, the baseline, I think, is a QRM up. Okay, good, I am on track. So now go briefly, you know, I, uh, I'm really excited about this whole system, uh, how to use machine learning for systems. And so, so here is a story here. It's like, you know, obviously and undeniable machine learning has been hugely successful, deep learning in particular in the past eight years, nine years, right? Quite amazing. Um, and, but if you look at the task, they are, they've been very successful on human tasks, human level tasks. What do you, you know, speech recognition, video recognition, language translation, even playing games, right? You say playing games with superhuman capabilities. And the point here is that uh, this, again, no question about these are, it's, it's, these are breakthroughs. Um, however, one characteristic about this, many of these tasks is that they don't require 100% accuracy. Why? Because the humans are not 100% accurate. However, in other applications, like uh, you know, robotic surgery or more great decision or you know, program synthesis, it's like where you want you you do want at least you can argue that you want you know either one hundred percent accuracy or if you do something wrong, you have to understand what what happened. So you want to ensure correctness and ideal explainability at the same time. But at least you need to, to, to provide one of the two, right? If you make a if you, today, if you apply for a mortgage and you are denied, you can ask why. And the bank, bank should tell you why you are denied. And the reason for that, because they need to prove that they didn't use some, uh, you know, racial profiling or something like that, which is uh, not unlawful to deny your mortgage. So the way they prove that, they tell you how they made the decision, right? So that's why actually in many of these cases, you can use a neural network, okay? So, so, so this is it. So basically the main idea here is that instead of using uh, neural networks end to end, you use a neural network to synthesize some classic solutions. Um, I'll, I'll give you some examples, rules and everything. So, and there are three approaches, at least there are maybe more, but three approaches we use so far. One is correct by construction. Um, you can build a solution which is probably correct. I don't have that example. I'm not going to go over the example. But for instance, if I want to optimize, if I do want to do join optimization, I have a set of tables in a database, and I want to come up with the order in which I'm going to join this table so that I minimize the cost. It's an n factorial, or n is the number of uh, tables space, right? So what I know there is that once I join all the tables, I have the correct solution, no matter the order, right? Because the join is commutative and associative operation. Okay. The second one is an iterative optimization. You have a sequence also transformation without impacting correctness, and I'll be now. And then the last one is generate and verify. Right? So here, iterative optimization means that I start from a solution, from an artifact, which I know is correct, a query plan in a database. And then I, I, I apply transformation on that query plan to modify it, to make it more efficient, to make it more secure, whatever the objective is. But in each transformation I'm applying to it, I'm guaranteed that the correctness is, 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 uh, is, uh, is maintained. Right? None of this transformation uh, uh, hurts the, you know, compromise the correctness. And generate and verify, it's, you generate a solution and you hopefully have a way to verify whether it's correct or not. Okay? So neurocuts, again, I'm going to go a little bit fast. Uh, how many of you are familiar with packet classification? How many? Okay, this is pretty fundamental, okay? It's networking, I, you know, I, I'm starting, I started my uh, career, research career as a networking person. So basically, in the internet, you have all these packets coming in. You need to, there are some boxes out there. We have to, de to decide what to do with the packets, right? Drop packets because maybe they believe that it's an, uh, they belong to an attack. 
If they don't know, you may send to the nutrition detection box, things like that, right? You may treat them with a higher quality, decide that some packets have higher qualities, maybe video or audio, things like that, okay? So, so this is done by packet classification. So how you do that, you look at the packet header, you know the packet header is source and destination IP address, source and destination port numbers, and the protocol type, they look at this, the, these labels and then decide what to do with it, what class belongs into it, okay? The problem is there are a lot of rules, right, and huge amount of rules, you know, 100k rules, and the, you need to do this as a line speed. You have a few microseconds to make this, to make this decision, at most, even less, okay? Because you have, a, you know, now you have 50 gigs or 100 gigs network. This problem is similar to the point location problem in the hypercube because the way you define the classes, you give the range of each of these fields, right? So say in this, in this case, on the x-axis, you have a source IP address in the packet and the y-axis destination IP address. So I'm going to specify a class. I say the range of the source IP addresses and destination IP address is defined a class. Any packet in that range belongs to this class, and I'm going to take the action x on the back, right? So now you see that it's a a packet has a particular source address and destination address, so it's a point in this space, so you need to check whether that point, to find these boxes, right, which represent classes, to which this packet belongs. Okay, I'll go this and then I'll, I'll close. I have only two minutes. <laughs> um, um, and this is a hard problem. It's either... Um, you need to compromise, it's a, it's a hard trade-off between the space, space comp complexity and, um, and uh, 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 com you know, computation complexity. If you aren't log n or n is a number of rules, right, so you build a tree, then the space you need is n power d, where d is a number of dimensions, it's a number of fields. If you aren't linear space uh, of n, then you are going to compromise on the computer. Right. So as such, for the past 20 years, a huge number of heuristics have been invented, right? And they are also harder solution, but they are very energy inefficient and like, expensive. And basically, many of them, they build the decision tree, like you'd expect, right? So it's again, what we use here, two minutes, and I'll, I'll, I'll finish. Um, what we use here is that, um, it's again, one solution you can think about is a neural network. You use a neural network, you use a packet header, based on the packet header, you define the class, yeah. and you decide what to do with the packet. The problem with that is not 100% accurate. Yeah. And if it's a secu security application, you cannot use it. Furthermore, you need to, to change the routers, and good luck with evaluating one network in, one micro, in a few microseconds. Okay. So instead, what we do is to use a machine learning in order to compute the decision tree. Right? That's what we do. We used to generate this decision, decision tree. We use reinforcement learning. You know about reinforcement learning. Roy here teaches two classes this quarter about reinforcement learning. So um, I'm not going to go into more details. But basically, the way we do it is like we state, we, 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 we start with a single node which contains all the classes. And this is a correct solution. We start with a correct solution because you know, you like all the rules are in this class, so you get a packet, you go sequential and look at all the rules. But then you need to split them because that's very inefficient. So you start to split them, right, by different dimensions, right? And that's each action is to split it. And like in reinforcement learning, you take this, this decision or this, uh, make these actions to split to create a tree, and at the end you have a reward. You see how good of how good is your solution. And the reward here. It's about the reward has to be positive, but here it's a cost, so you want something negative, so that's why you have the minuses. Depth of the tree is a computation complexity, right? It's how long it takes to decide which class of packet belongs. The other one, the size of the tree, is how much memory do you need, right? So it's a linear combination between the two. This is an example about iterative optimization because you start from a single node, which is correct, and you iteratively refine, build the tree. Uh, and at each step, you know that that solution is correct. And the result, um, 
the classification time, the median is 18% faster than the state of the art across all the, uh, you know, and this here I am looking at only one matrix classification time. If you look at about both matrix, um, you know, it's, if you fix one metric and say I'm looking at all the, all the other solutions which achieve this, this classification time, on memory we are 3x better at least. And the other way around. If you fix a memory, say this is efficient footprint, you are 3x better than uh, other computation. Okay, so um, I'll uh, stop here. This is some work which I'm doing, I, I've done also with Roy, so Roy can tell you everything about this work. So I don't need to tell you, I'm just trying to... Uh, okay. So, in summary, um, at Rice Lab, our goal is to develop open source platforms, tools, and algorithms for real-time intelligent decisions Decisions which are secure and explainable. And I hope that in this talk I give you a few examples uh, which I think it's, you know, are projects which are the intersection between uh, machine learning and systems. And I think it's obviously, it's very exciting, I'm biased, it's a very exciting area. And it's a lot of work uh, we can do as a system people uh, to, you know, to do more charge, so to speak, machine learning research. And if you think about, at the end of the day, you know, the systems play a huge role in making all this machine learning uh, revolution possible, right? It's like, you know, huge network training, huge uh, machine learning networks and so forth. Um, and the other thing I think is very exciting is about um, using machine learning in solving systems and engineering problems, and you you know, you can do that, and this is uh, what particularly exciting, uh, without, at least for some problems, without compromising the correctness or uh, still retaining the explainability of the solution, which I think is extremely important. Uh, look, you know. Yeah, thank you.